So the first of our guest speakers is none other than Nick Hudson. And Nick is an actuary by profession. He's also the CEO at Sana Partners, as well as the coordinator of Panda, which is Pandemics Data and Analytics. Now, Nick has been quite outspoken about the stats relating to COVID-19. And we welcome him here today to share his insights. Over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Simon and team, and uh, very good morning to you all on this 130th or whatever day of lockdown. I have lost count. Okay, um, and it's a good idea to, to use the cover of the actuary thing to apologize for being a numbers guy. I, um, I know that that can be a very difficult uh, uh, way to hear things about the pandemic. In terms of numbers, it's very impersonal, and I do realize that a lot of people are affected by coronavirus and that it can come across kind of harsh and a little bit cold just to talk about everything in terms of numbers. So, you know, please just uh, bear with me in, in that regard. And then also, I'd just like to point out, I, I, I'm, I've been doing a hell of a lot of presentations and podcasts in the last month in connection with all of this, the last two months, really. And um, I'm used to presenting for like an hour and a half. So I'm squeezing quite a bit of material down into a shorter space. And one of the consequences of that is that you will hear me say a hell of a lot of decisive things. Um, and I, it, I want you just to understand, we, we have a ethos at Panda of having strong opinions weekly held. So we're open to challenge in, in the questions and I'm just uh, speeding through this. So things are gonna sound very declarative. I do want to assure you that everything I'm going to tell you today is stuff that we have out there in numerous papers and publications and podcasts and radio interviews and, uh, you know, academic style papers and uh, um, uh, 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 newspaper articles and so on. So this is, I'm not glibly doing anything here. This is all of the, res the result of many, many hours of work by uh, what is now quite a, quite a large team of about 30 people. Um, about a third of whom are uh, maybe even half are more into the data uh, than into the law or the politics of the situation. Um, and as Simon said, Panda is an organization, an impromptu organization assembled over the course of the last three months in response to what we saw as a lot of bad science in the thinking around lockdown and uh, the pandemic modeling and so on. And so we've been taking the scientists on um, and trying to replace what we see as bad science with some good science. And I'm gonna try and give you a very high level, fast summary of that today. Please, if you are interested in what I have to say and don't uh, get enough detail for your liking, take note of our website and our Twitter handle. Uh, that should guide you to a lot. The website is full of rich content, including podcasts and all our articles and so on. So we, have for quite some time being be, refused to refer to this as a pandemic. We refer to it as a panicdemic. And that's the first of those hard, brutal facts I've just given you right there. Okay. Um, we see lockdown as an unprecedented policy that turns out not to work. And we're not just saying in South Africa, we're pointing to the international data. Um, there's a lot of bad signs going around from the epidemiologists and virologists and immunologists, uh, others who should know better. What I will assure you is it's not all of them. There's a minority of voices that are really not being held or really not being heard all around the world um, and with whom we are in contact. Um, it's almost like a, you know, a parallel universe where uh, rationality prevails and um, panic is left in a corner. Um, and those are the people we tap into to um, help us generate our research findings and uh, to apply them in the South African context. And then I was also asked to touch on the economic consequences of the lockdown. Um, uh, I'm going to try and make that sort of a minority of the time. Um, and let me just, while I'm thinking about it, have a clock here so I can see how I'm doing. Um, before I talk about uh, lockdown in particular, I just want to remind people of the setup here. Um, we refer to this little tweet here. Um, by Tedros of the World Health Organization as the most costly misrepresentation in world history. On uh, one evening on the 3rd of March, not so long ago, Tedros came out with this tweet which said that globally about 3.4% of reported COVID cases have died 
by comparison, seasonal flu generally kills far fewer than 1% of those infected. And the reason I call this a misrepresentation is what Tedros was doing in this tweet was conflating two entirely different um, concepts. The one which we agree with is that flu generally kills far fewer, fewer than 1% than of those infected. It's close to 0.1% or maybe even lower. Um, so we agree with that part. That is what you call the infection fatality rate of flu. But by comparing it to another number, this 3.4% of reported cases, he was crossing a line and he was going into a territory of what's called a case fatality rate. Now, a case fatality rate is the percentage of people who are diagnosed and confirmed through some form of test um, who then go on to, to, to pass away. And the problem there is that the multiple of infections to cases everywhere in the world and with respect to almost all diseases is a massive multiple. Um, with respect to coronavirus, it could be anywhere between eight and 200 times the number of cases, depending on what country you're in. And the reason for that is the vast majority of people who are infected by this virus um, either have very, uh, have totally asymptomatic disease causes or only generate very mild symptoms. And so they're not gonna rock up at a hospital or a doctor or go for a test. And whereas the people who do go for a test are your more seriously ill people. And of course, if that's the starting point, not the infection infected group, but the seriously ill group, then this number is much higher. And by failing to clarify that and never ever actually walking this statement back, what Tedros did was set off a panic. Helped along, of course, by media and by the situations that were emerging in China and the Diamond Princess and Northern Italy. But what's actually emerged is that the, the infection fatality rate for this disease, if you look at it, you know, I'm speaking broadly on a global basis, is actually more or less in line with the flu, 0.1%. And the mortality numbers on a population level are also more or less in line with the flu. What's different? Well, this disease comes in a much sharper wave it looks like than the flu, or it's actually not much sharper, slightly sharper wave than the flu. And I must remind you that the flu is an annual story. Uh, every single year you have um, in South Africa around 10, 12,000 people in a, in a normal year who, who will die from the flu. And according to our analysis, that's more or less what we expect will be the mortality rate, the population mortality rate here in South Africa. So that was very much in our minds ground zero in this whole story. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that helped us panic along was the very famous Neil Ferguson's presentation shortly, uh, it was roughly around this time, I can't remember the precise date. Um, he came out with a model in which he predicted that the UK would lose half a million people. We had already been analyzing information that was coming out of the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Um, and that's a very important event, that one. Um, when you are presented with such a, a situation, well, apart from its drama and the tragedy on board with the virus sweeping through the ship and the Japanese authorities not allowing that ship to dock at all, um, you get what for epidemiologists or scientists who are studying uh, uh, an, an epidemic, you get what's called a petri dish experiment. Uh, you've got a closed population of people and if it's analyzed properly and the characteristics of the people who succumb are accurately described, you can generate a very clear picture of how this um, disease is likely to um, behave in the real world. And, and when I say a clear picture, I mean the type of clarity that in the absence of such a petri dish experiment, you would take years to understand fully in, if you were just collecting statistics in the wilds. And so we took advantage of that Diamond Princess uh, uh, situation and the academic papers that were written shortly after the event. And we used that to come up with a set of numbers, which we called the Diamond Press Princess numbers. And they were simple calculations, just applying the fatality rates by age on that boat to the rest of the world's countries. And those Diamond Princess numbers um, came up with values like for South Africa, 20,000. And for the UK, I think the number was 78,000. And so we were very surprised when this guy in the UK stood up and said that half a million people were going to die in the UK. And we thought that sounded terribly wrong based on the statistics that we were looking at. Um, and those diamond princess numbers that we uh, suggested would be maximum levels for what might be incurred 
in the, the general population have held up very well. Not a single country has exceeded that level. Uh, the one that came closest is very famously um, Belgium. And they're at about 80%, I think 70% of that diamond princess value. So that model, that very simple little model of ours has behaved very well. We've since refined it because shortly after that, we observed that in developing countries, the disease causes was much, was much milder and we reduced those. So that was the second element of the panic was this, these very overwrought models. And I'm afraid to say the models in, in, all over the world continue to be overwrought in South Africa. The prediction of 40 to 50,000 deaths is, we believe, desperately inaccurate. And as an example of this, I'll show you what happened. Uh, on the 12th of June, the South African Consortium of, uh, sorry, the South African Coronavirus Modeling Consortium issued a, an update of their model, which we'd been disagreeing with. We'd been invited into Zuelia Mkise's um, um, modeling consortium presentation, the modeling, modeling symposium meeting at the end of May. And we said to them, look guys, these, these are the things we think you're getting wrong. Um, we were very surprised when uh, a couple of weeks later they reissued their model with we couldn't see any real changes other than that they'd shifted the thing along to catch up with the actual real data. As you can see on the left of that chart that presents the starting date for that modeling update and I'm going to draw your attention to the Western Cape charts on the right there. Um, those red dots didn't exist at the time when that model was released because those are the actual uh, numbers of deaths in the Western Cape uh, on a cumulative basis and the chart on the bottom right is the model that we responded uh, with on that same day when we saw what was going on we wrote to them and said look here this is what our model is showing it's entirely different from yours and we predicted on that day that their model would blow through its lowest confidence interval which as you can see from the chart on the top right was extremely wide and we said it would go through its lowest confidence interval on the 13th of July we were we were wrong it turned out to be the 12th of July but you can see our model at the bottom there is actually two confidence intervals much tighter and the thing has for the whole month tracked and we've of course gone out of that month the end of that chart is 15 july and the thing continues to track straight down the middle um and so you know that gave a little bit of uh, we believe a little bit of credibility to our work and and diminished the credibility of our modelers um and you can see it leads on in the western cape basis to a much less dramatic result so too for the country we still expect that 10,000 is a pretty good estimate for the number of people who will pass away from coronavirus it might be oh, well it will obviously be somewhat higher maybe somewhat lower than that number we've had no cause to update that basic 10,000 death estimate for now going on three months against this drama there's also a lot of noise in the media um, and a lot of it is very damaging in our in our estimation um, statistics are taken out of context context is not explained. Uh, there are outright misrepresentations of, uh, of and, and statements of false news or, um, you know, untruth. And that's a very disturbing element of this, which has greatly led to an environment of fear and panic. Um, for example, at the moment, it's on the tips of everybody's tongue, that, tongues that South Africa ranks fifth in the world in case numbers. And again, I remind you of my criticism of that three March announcement of Tedros's uh, said the problem with it was he was focusing on cases and what are those those are the uh, infected people who have been detected so it depends a lot on how much testing you're doing and we're doing an awful lot of testing in South Africa um, another way of misrepresenting this data would be to say that South Africa ranks 22nd in the world in number of deaths that's true but more importantly and a more better way to look at it would be to say that we rank 44th in the world in deaths per million, which is a way of standardizing for the size of your population to reflect, you know, is this a large or a small number of deaths? Because South Africa's number of deaths would be a very small number for the United States, but a very large number for the Vatican City. Um, and when you look at the numbers in that context, South Africa's situation doesn't look nearly as bad as those headlines would suggest, does it? I mean, here we sit, you know, um, with other developing countries doing much worse than us. And that's, that's good news. It's, it's in line with what we predicted. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. You know, when we started charting the mortality on maps and so on to try and work out what was going on, what was clear from very early on is that the developing countries were much worse off. Uh, and then within those developing countries, there were clusters that had particularly bad experience, the worst being Northwest and Southern Europe. Um, Eastern Europe, very interestingly, had an extremely mild course. 
and then North America, slightly better. They've had a much better experience than Europe, uh, despite all the noise that you hear about the US and CNN and everybody going on and on in the New York Times. It's quite a good deal lighter in the US than in Europe. And then after that, the tropical countries in South America, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, uh, and, and Brazil. And, um, you know, outside of that, the rest of the world, this thing has been a bit of a no-show, I'm afraid to say. And I know, again, actuarial talk a bit hard on the ears of anybody who has been sick or lost somebody that they love. Um, but that's the truth. Uh, this wouldn't really qualify as a pandemic if you excluded those heavily impacted countries. And I mean, there are countries in the world that have recorded zero coronavirus deaths, and it's not because the coronavirus isn't there. Um, <clears throat> Just to bring that message home again of the intense difference between regions, that top chart on top right chart is uh, Europe, Northwest, Eastern, Southern Europe. And that shaded area at the bottom shows you how much lighter the experience in Eastern Europe is. This is in terms of, again, deaths per million. So it's measuring the fatality rate in a population. And that if you're a scientist and you see that, you start asking questions immediately and you wonder where in the world your country might fit. And you start being very careful about which country's information you use to construct your model of what's gonna happen in the country. And we believe that's the part that didn't happen properly with our models. Again, on the bottom left, it's North America versus Latin America. And on the right, on the same scale, that's Asia. Just bringing home that point that different regions have had quite different experience. I didn't have Africa on there because I couldn't. If I'd used that axis for Africa, you wouldn't even be able to see the deaths. And so what I've done on this page is contrast the, the worst countries in the world on the top right with Southern and Northern Africa. And I will forgive you if you say that you still can't see the chart. And I will point out that I've already zoomed it in. Look at the axis on the top right chart that goes up to 900 deaths per million. And the axis on the bottom right chart goes up to 350. So I've already zoomed in and you can still barely see the impact of this disease. So why is South Africa in such a better position than uh, so many other countries? Well, there are obvious reasons and some non-obvious ones. The, the most obvious one is that this is a disease that fundamentally kills very old and very sick people. By far the majority of cases. In Italy, 60% of all deaths were among people who had three or more very serious comorbidities. 96.4% were among people who had one very serious comorbidity or more. The, the median age was, I think, 85 at death. So this is predominantly worldwide a disease that affects older people. And again, the actuary speaking, I know, I know there are younger people who have passed away. Maybe they had comorbidities, maybe they had undiagnosed comorbidities, or maybe they didn't and were very unlucky, just had for whatever reason a suppressed immune system at the time. But we also know, for example, and something to be aware of is that some people are recorded as COVID deaths in South Africa when we know that they are not actually dying clinically from COVID. Um, and this is a common thing worldwide. In the United States, it represents a big portion of those COVID statistics will be somebody who tests positive on admission to hospital, but he's been admitted for a heart attack and he then passes away, but is recorded as a coronavirus death. We've had cases of car and motorbike accidents being recorded as coronavirus deaths. So you have to be very careful as a scientist looking at this information as to how you interpret it. You can't just look at the deaths in the grouping of age 30 to 40 and conclude that there actually are coronavirus deaths, that could be very wrong, very misleading. And we've even found cases in South Africa where families, you know, say the doctor put COVID on the death certificate. We didn't want to, that's not how the person died. He's been dying from cancer for five years, you know, that kind of situation. So, you know, we must just be mindful that, that they, not to interpret data without a critical mind. Um, I mentioned that there were some other not so obvious factors. Um, we built a big model uh, to try and understand and unpack and get a bit predictive about where mortality goes in the world and compare all the factors in a statistical or a robust scientific statistical way to see if there's a relationship that we can predict. And so this chart summarizes that model. It's a couple of weeks old now, I need to update it, but the, um, that, that shows the difference between the actual and the expected values on our model. And you can see, you know, there's a correlation and explains quite a lot of the variation between countries. But the good news is that South Africa sits in that, uh, can't actually see it on the chart today, sorry. Um, but it's, it's, it's in the bottom sort of half of that story, not in the top half. Um, the other factor that is uh, significant that we have found and that's been very robust in our investigations is obesity. 
uh, obesity does score as a relevant risk factor. Um, initially, we thought it wasn't one. We thought it was simply a reflection of the fact that uh, people who are obese tend to have lots of comorbidities, and it's the comorbidities that are relevant. But it turns out that in addition to comorbidities, obesity is a relevant risk factor. Now, very interestingly, one of the things that's not a risk factor, as it turns out, is whether or not your country is locked down. And this tends to be the part of our message that is the hardest, hardest thing for people to hear, and the one that I get screamed about the most. Um, but we have studied this thing inside and out, and there, there are several ways of approaching it. I'll discuss two very briefly right now. The one is to take uh, all of the mortality rates in the world and compare them to their lockdown stringency scores and to see if there's any relationship. Um, and that's exactly what this chart portrays. And you know, we call that in statistics by the technical term, a paint splat. There's no correlation there. There's no relationship whatsoever. And another way of doing it is to look at the individual death curves of countries and to try and see whether you can detect what's called a regime change. Uh, what that is is statistical jargon for a change in the distribution that's governing the death curves after an event. And in this case, the event would be either the inception of lockdown or the suspension of lockdown. And after looking at 147 countries, we can detect no significant um, regime changes. In other words, the death curves are not responding to the implementation or lifting of lockdown. And that's a very robust finding. And it's not just us seeing this. There are lots of researchers in the world who have discovered this result. And the, the, as I said, I would just discuss the two methods briefly. I will add one data point. We have had a huge effort to try and uncover data that supports the opposite, uh, opposite conclusion. In other words, that lockdowns are effective. And we find that the information we get is of a very bad nature. It tends to be these pairwise comparisons. You know, people pick their favorite two countries, which is usually Sweden and Finland. Um, ignore the fact that there are lots of factors that drive mortality differences between two countries, focus on the difference between the lockdowns in those two countries and conclude that lockdowns work. And that is quite simply not scientific. To put it all in perspective, just to wrap this all up in terms of the disease and I can move on to the economy. Um, what we have here in South Africa is a situation that as of today with all of the year to date deaths, recorded at their normal rates according to the World Health Organization and coronavirus according to the actual death count a couple of days ago. Coronavirus ranks like quite far down the list of material natural causes of death. Of course, above all of this are, are uh, sorry, this is of all cause deaths. Um, it, 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 it's quite far down the, the list, sitting quite between kidney disease and neonatal disorders. Um, as a cause of death. And you see above there, there's some infectious diseases which are always around us, such as uh, tuberculosis, HIV, and diarrheal diseases that uh, are, will stay above coronavirus for the rest of it, the epidemic in South Africa. Um, and uh, that's a particularly tragic aspect because our treatment, our ability to treat and manage all of those diseases has deteriorated dramatically as a result of lockdown. And one of the things that we expect, I'm afraid, is that lockdown will itself cause much more by way of loss of life than coronavirus. And we've, I won't be able to go into the details of that. We wrote, wrote a detailed paper way back in May, early May, late April, uh, making that argument and presenting the science behind that. And you'll be able to get that on our website. To move out of lockdown into the economy, I just want to point out one thing. Those same people who launched the panic, 3.4 versus 0.1% story, have also put in place ridiculous policy what a nation has to do in order to leave lockdown. Um, bearing in mind what I said about the number of infections always being a massive multiple of the number of cases and most of those being very hard to detect because people are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. None of these conditions that the World Health Organization lays out are even remotely attainable for most countries. I don't even go as far as to say for all countries. Um, and that for us is a bad news story. Moving on to the economic consequences. Um, there's, a, there's a very bad piece of thinking, which I would also describe as bad science, even though I'm one of these people who's hesitant to call economics a science. I'm dry and boring in this regard, but uh, it's a humanity and um, economic numbers 
can easily be distorted and they regularly are when people talk about the impact of lockdown. There's a, a, a very bad idea going around that, no, no, look, the lockdown didn't make a difference. The real impact was the virus. And, you know, in terms of the economic impact, whether or not we've ha we had uh, a lockdown, we would have had a bad economy. So stop going on about how the lockdown causes the economy to tank. Um, I would ask you just to approach this from a man in the street point of view, because I think that's the most powerful perspective and to consider the question whether it doesn't make a huge difference to a company out there to have its revenues go down a bit because uh, people are not getting out about as much and don't have as much money to spend versus having its revenues turned off. Um, I think most people find it readily accessible that the latter is a much worse situation than the former. And when you get past the nonsense headlines in the New York Times and these horrible media outlets who have been fear-mongering fear scaremongering and sowing panic amongst the world's population, um, and you get to the real data, this is the kind of thing you see where the relationship between GDP movements and uh, the lockdown stringency is this sharply downward line. The harder you lock down, the worse the economy does. Bear in mind what I mentioned earlier, economic results mediate livelihoods and livelihoods mediate life when the economy goes down people die because of it and that is going to happen i'm afraid in south africa we expect a, a rising mortality rate starting now a few weeks ago as the real depth of the poverty that is caused by the lockdown starts to bite and we have an increase in infectious disease mortality and uh, diseases of despair uh, plus the lockdown primary causes of um, absent cancer testing, tuberculosis and HIV management programs that have been you know, run into dereliction and so on. So we fully expect this and we think it's too late to do anything about it other than to lessen further effect by ending the lockdown now. Another chart that brings us home. Nick, I think we've lost you. Hi, everyone. I think we're having a problem. I think we're having a problem with, uh, with Nick's uh, signal there, or maybe you got hit with some unexpected load shedding. Um, which is unfortunate. I'm going to keep talking <laughs> while he's uh, trying to get back on because I think you'll agree this is fascinating and, and hugely interesting. Um, certainly different to, to a lot of what we've been seeing in the, in the media. Um, and, and I think it is important, um, whilst we're obviously all focused on, on not breaking the law and following the, the lockdown rules, and we're committed to that. Nick, are you back with us? Yeah, I'm back with you. Sorry, I had a power failure. Okay, <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> the other thing that uh, is probably more problematic than Corona. Um, anyway, back to you, Nick. If you're gonna, if you if Eskom is gonna shut me down, I might as well have been on the the thank you page. Um, uh, are you seeing the presentation still? Um, there's no point really uh, not, sharing. Not yet, uh, Nick. Just wanted to conclude there with a few go. remarks. Um, so let me just check that I didn't miss anything. No. Okay. So I, I, I want to just quickly use a minute to start in a quick appeal here. First of all, I again remind you, uh, I've never presented to an audience on this kind of topic in such a short period of time. And I, I totally accept it. If this is sounding like just scandalous, scandalously against the spirit of the times, I realize that it is. And what I'd encourage you to do, we've got some longer form podcasts and presentations on our website, lots of uh, material um, engaging in many aspects in a presentation and please save some answers for some questions for later for the panel. Um, and I would also urge you, please, uh, once you've done that and comforted yourself that I'm not a madman, um, please, uh, would you consider what you can do in your community and your social media to assist with what I think will be the biggest part of coming out of this economic slump when the lockdown finally is lifted. And that is overcoming fear. People have 
a crazy perception of this disease and, and its risks, they forget that or don't know that 99.95% or so of the people who will be infected with this disease in South Africa will recover. And that almost all of that point Oh, so 0.05 percent of the people, you know, the the 0.05 percent who, who are unlucky enough to pass away ill. So younger people, like I'll say ourselves, I'm not too sure of the age distribution of the audience, um, are really not materially at risk here, and and it's no different from the risk that you would face in any normal winter with a flu bug going around. Um, your risk of driving to the shopping centre is much higher than walking around. Thank you, guys.